All right. Good day, everyone. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, special in the sense that, of course, a very good friend of mine. Uh, I love to call him Vicente, you know, <laughs> even if we're good friends. But of course, his close friends call him Vincent. Uh, Vicente Rafael, Professor Vicente Rafael is, of course, joining us now from Seattle, uh, University of Washington. Um, he is one of the most outside the box uh, established historians. I mean, this is what I like about you, Vincent. I mean, it's, it's one thing to be outside the box when you're just starting in your career and you want to make some waves, you know. <laughs> but it's another thing when you're an established historian like you and then you're still pushing the boundary. I love that. I really appreciate it. And I had, of course, the pleasure of, of reviewing uh, your latest book or at least one of your latest books, sorry, uh, analyzing or psychoanalyzing the Duterte administration, but of course, when it comes to Vicente Rafael, the work of yours that that caught my attention were the very things you were writing about are illustrados, you know, beginning from the birth of the Filipino nation. And what I like about your writing is that I won't say they're irreverent, but they're kind of a very derrida, deconstructing, you know, <laughs> like in your face. So, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Rafael, or my good friend Vicente, for joining us. <laughs> Oh, I welcome. I, I I thank you so much too, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. I mean, I to be honest, I've been uh, meaning to do this for quite some time, but you know, I just yeah. I didn't know if you're you're okay with my crazy time uh, you know, slots, you know, because go with Leloy sometimes we do it at 7 a.m. his time. And I was saying, oh my yeah. goodness, like yeah. the is the same time zone yeah. as Lele. I was yeah. not sure. But can the other day I was thought, no, 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 I really need to have Vicente here. So every time um, you know, I see something from Lula, Luna. So I just saw two Lunas in the past week or so. We had the yeah. Philippine Spanish Friendship Day. And I said, there's no way I'm not going to have Amigo Vicente here because yeah. he's been yeah. one of the guys who I think has had very, very trenchant analysis of, of the, the Spanish legacy in the Philippines. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is that it just happens that the book I, I was reading recently by John Siddell extensively quotes from you like extensively but i'm almost fanboy level in the man no 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 yeah. no but your your argument of the promise of the foreign yeah but it's like uh it's kind of like a handle like imagine communities right there's just so yeah. much going on with your analysis so with that introduction uh vicente because i want to tell our mm -hmm. audience uh you know uh, how much i appreciate your contribution to the literature aside from your uh, you know, funky tweets <laughs> and my funky counter tweets and I, you know, as we're yeah. friends. Do that. Yeah. Let's get down to this, uh, Vicente. First of all, now, recently we had the Luna, Mad Genius, all of that discussion coming back with the yeah. Jaime, no Jaime. Uh, yeah. First of all, what are your reaction about the painting? Have you heard about that? Uh, you know, what are your initial impressions yeah. of the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting phenomenon. And, uh, what I'm what I'm more interested in is not so much the painting; it's the reception, it's the contemporary exactly. reception of the painting, and uh, why there's this incredible mania, all of a sudden, uh, around you know uh, a, a Luna painting, which I mean I don't think it's any better than Spolarium. I think Spolarium is far and away superior. No, uh, <clears throat> this uh, this this particular painting. Uh, was uh, first of all, it's very interesting how it was hyped up, right? Uh, this sort of story, almost like a fairy tale that was built around by it. business people, right? Who have an interest in hyping it up, just to be clear, auctioneer, yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And and it's it's uh, among other things, it's a very elaborate uh, public relations ploy, uh, certainly advertisement. Uh, and uh, so, so that that was one thing. The second thing is that uh, through all the publicity, there was no sense in which why is this a good painting? I mean, what what is it about it that makes this uh, such an incredible painting? When in fact, you know, you could argue that it was. Uh, I mean, it's pretty sort of standard, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, French academic style painting. Very safe. Uh, very conservative. Classical, yeah. Uh, it's classical, but also very, I mean, you know, the craftsmanship and everything was nice, but I mean, 1889 was the year that, you know, uh, Van Gogh was painting his stuff. I mean, this was the height of Impressionism, right? And Impressionism was precisely, you know, the revolutionary art that was trying to get away from all this. And Luna was very much implicated 
in uh, you know the more traditional, the more conservative uh, style, and you know within reason because this was the stuff that sold. You know he was interested in, in 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 making his stuff available. This was the stuff that got into the uh, competitions and so forth and so on. You know so, so 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 there was something about this painting that that struck me as as fairly conventional and fairly traditional, and yet. The way people were talking about it was that it, it was like the holy grail, like that was the term that was being used. Literally, right? that's the term. Yeah, and what was being foregrounded was the process by which it was uh, thought to be lost and then found and then brought back to the Philippines like a big, big white whale, right? This is the big white whale of Philippine art. But really, it's all about, it's, it's a story not less about art. It's really a story about uh, collectors and what collectors go through and the real hero are collectors, right? And so and so one of the things that I found very curious in the coverage, in the press coverage of this of this event, the, the unveiling and so forth. Number two, who owned it before this person? Number three, how much did it cost to buy this uh, piece of art? You know, so, so basic political economic questions uh, sort of fell away and and uh, uh, it, and I can only imagine that when it finally when it's finally auctioned and I, I'm sure it will be auctioned no? uh, because of course whoever bought it wants to recover their investment right I mean it's gonna cost a, a, a lot <laughs> you know, I mean uh, I was talking to some business people including you know Filipina Espanol friends and I mean we were yeah. looking at like at least 10,000 percent profit after yeah. all the hype and PR. Yeah. It looks like a very, oh, it looks like a PR yeah. coup. Uh, I mean, yeah. we said that before going to the political part, again, uh, one reason I like you is because, you know, we're kind of Renaissance managed, right? We can talk about anything yeah. that we're good at everything, but at least we bother. I mean, what is your take on this? Because you're not the first one who said that when it comes to Luna, a lot of his works, whether, you know, I saw his, you know, death of Cleopatra, et cetera, in Madrid, uh, just the, uh, earlier this year, like, they're amazing, but you're right. They're not at the cutting edge of the techniques. It's not pushing the boundaries. So you have people like my good friend Jorge Mojaro, uh, uh, um, that you know Mihara, who's like you know mm -hmm. Philippine Spanish scholar. He was saying like, yeah, I mean, uh, he was more a fan of uh, Isabella de los Reyes, which is of course, you know, I, mm -hmm. I I also think he's he's the most underrated and perhaps the best really of all of them. But mm -hmm. going back to this, was this also about let's go psychological? Was this also about beating the, the white man in his own game kind of thing, right? The idea is I'm going to go so perfect on the traditional classical way that there will be no question about whether a colonized colored man like me can, like, I'll beat the masters in their own game, right? Because if I went the Van Gogh and, I don't know, pre-Picasso mm -hmm. way, yeah. it would not go on a one-to-one. On -one no, no, for sure. Level. For sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think what Luna was trying to do was he was trying to, you know, as you say, beat beat the, the, the Europeans at their own game. Uh, and he did so very well. I mean, it, I mean, the whole illustrado culture was like that, you know? That's why they took up fencing. That's why they went bodybuilding. That's why they tried to have affairs with European women. Uh, you know, and, and European, having affairs with European women was a big thing. You know, like I, I started to tell you, there was a, you know, the, this, this really interesting story about Jose Pangariban, right? Who, uh, uh, was having an affair with a Spanish woman whose husband uh, uh, sort of found him walking around Madrid and beat the shit out of him, right? He was very badly beaten. And this was big news among the Filipino community in Spain that, uh, you know, but at the same time, they were kind of like proud. Uh, oh, that's our boy. You know, he can screw around. He he knows how to it's get kind of a to... false Pinoy pride. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very <laughs> fast. Sounds very Tata Digong, you know, like you know yeah, it, yeah, 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 exactly. No, but, it, you, but you can see how highly politicized it was. It wasn't just about bragging that hey, you know, I can I'm I'm such a I, I'm such a macho guy I can have sex with whoever I want, especially European women. But it, it's also about beating the European at their own game. So it was highly politicized. Now it was about proving a point that we're not effeminate, we're not emasculated, you know, that uh, we're macho, that we can do these things that you can. And, and the whole and, mustachioid uh, culture. Oh yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's part of that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the, 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 you know there was a. There was a Spanish writer, very notorious Spanish writer, Kiyokya was his uh, was his uh, nickname, right? Uh, and and he would write things like you know write really insulting 
racist things about Filipinos. And one of the things he would say is that, well, Filipinos are so immature, they can't even grow facial hair, right? They don't even have hair on their chest. So, you know, that was, uh, having, having hair was a big deal, uh, facial and otherwise was a big deal for Filipinos. Once again, to prove their manhood, you know, their manliness, so. Yeah. Uh, this is what, late 19th century already? May ganun pa rin? Or 1880s, is it... 1880s, 1890s. In oh, fact, so even it, late 19th century messed oh, up. Yeah. Right? yeah, no, oh, in, yeah. In, in, fact, oh, yeah. in fact, scientific racism was very big in Spain. No, it was very big in Spain at this time. Is it time. from, via, via the... The English or via the Germans or their own version? I, know, the German I, 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 is the I, most notorious, yeah, right? Yeah, no, I, I'm sure it came from different streams, no? Uh, but there was this idea that, you know, for example, if uh, if a woman wanted to have a, uh, it, and this was from doctors, not Spanish doctors, that if a woman wanted to have a boy, she should eat a lot of meat, she should engage in a lot of physical activity, uh, on and on and on. But if she wanted to have a girl, she should be very domestic, very quiet. Uh, you know, she should eat vegetables and so forth. Right? So, yeah, she can have, I think she can I have still hear this stuff nowadays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> this is not late. This looks like 2023. Yeah. You know? yeah but, we but, 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 like but, but you can see it's all about controlling the population. Right. And so in that sense, it's yeah. very Foucaultian, right? It's exactly. About, I just want to say, like, this is yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the whole point. An is that, yeah. Exactly. Sex was about conduct and behavior, and behavior was about politics, and yeah. politics was about identity. So right. it was very important. Yeah. Right, right. Um, Let's go back to this because, in fairness, in defense of the PR people and the whole all the holy grail issue is, is is what I think is not very discussed in a lot of the PR, which is this was kind of like a, I mean, the reason perhaps this was supposedly among the favorites of Juan Luna's paintings, I mean, I mean is, is because it was also about consummation of his own love story, mm -hmm. which obviously ended in one of the most tragic ways. And mm -hmm. in a way that still circles back to the things you're saying, because the third party involved here was supposed to be a white man, right? And perhaps... Mm -hmm you know, that created a certain kind of over-aggressive reaction from Juan Luna, although we can also ask questions about, you know, how much he was in the right state of mind. You no, know? Was this really a crime of passion or it was just sheer criminality, you know? I, I, right? I mean, I think there's, there are things also going on there, right? Because we know that the, the subject of the painting is about these rituals, rites of marriage and union mm -hmm. in, in Rome, right? And one of the things that made Rome very attractive to many illustrados is the idea that in, in ancient Rome, you can be a Roman citizen, regardless of the skin color. You can be a black gladiator and make it to the top. You can come from the East, from the Middle East and mm -hmm. become a big guy. You can come from Spain and be like the Senecas and one of the core members of the, you know, the patrician mm -hmm. elite. And, and so for me, but and that, there's so much going on, no? And, and, and this painting was, mm -hmm. you know, conceptualized and made while they were having this honeymoon through Venice and all the gorgeous places in Europe. So right, there's right. so much going on there, right? Like right, I, don't right, about, right. I don't want to get into that, but it's right. there, and it's not people are not talking about it as much. But that's the thing, eh, right? So feeling go union appeal dinay because it has this kind of eerie uh, yeah. sense to it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like all of Luna's paintings, it's very allegorical, right? Uh, because even if you go to Spolarium, Spolarium also has a, of course. a kind of classical. Uh, theme uh, and uh, and of course he has a few paintings that have nothing to do with classical themes you know Mulakenia or various other uh, paintings that are much more quote unquote native uh, but but I think that the 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 you know I mean certainly there was a kind of allegorical uh, sort of referent uh, to in the case of Hymeny or Hymen Hymeny uh, and and uh, uh, I, I I think part of the fascination of the painting uh, is trying to unlock those allegories, trying to unlock the metaphors, you know? And so you, you have a lot of discussion about, you know, there's a turtle and what does that turtle mean? It's supposed to mean, you know, the exactly. domesticity of the woman, they, yeah. they're animals, uh, they're children. And so, you know, what, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know that, that's part of the fun of the painting is sort of trying to, trying to figure out, trying to interpret. Multi-layered, um, yeah. Very yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and and you know you you hand it to Luna, you know Luna uh, sort of put all those different elements there as a way of uh, making the painting interesting. Uh, but having said that, I mean the thing is that um, 
uh, it, it has to be seen. I think the painting has to be seen. And again, this didn't come through during the during the uh, <clears throat> Ayala unveiling. Uh, the painting has to be seen uh, within the context of Luna's art and life. Yeah, you know, the totality of yes. Luna's art and life. Like nobody talked about his, uh, the, you know, the crime against Paz and so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, I, I think there was a very studious avoidance. Strategic silence, I call it strategic yeah, silence. Yeah, strategic yeah. silence, right? Mm. right? Uh mm. around that. And uh people have pointed it out. Uh, but there hasn't been a debate, there hasn't been a response, which is I, and again, that's sort of one of the interesting things about about the reception, about the, the how shall I say it, the culture of reception in the Philippines. People don't want to debate. There's very studious avoidance of disagreements, of debates, of uh sort of back and forth you know people are really balat sibuyas so they you know they don't want to get into it right so if you tell them well how do you explain nobody wants to say anything so everyone's remained quiet everyone's you know sort of maintained a very polite silence uh and and i think sayang you know we're all we're all uh sort of impoverished by that lack of debate because uh we can't we can't further our understanding of Luna, of Illustrado art, and so forth and so on, uh, because people don't want to talk about it. You know, they just want to. Yeah, Vincent. Um, um, my thing I say is, I mean, I want to also get your point of view, and I completely see where you're coming from, right? And and of course, as quote unquote intellectuals, whatever you want to call ourselves, of course, we love to debate these things, right? This is our life. At the same time, parang it's not it's not mutually exclusive, but the idea is like. I mean, Luna is a tragic character, right? And and at the same time, complex character. At the same time, he's really one of the few guys, al along with Felix Hidalgo, among others, who kind of made it, no? Among the at least the masters out there in Europe. And the idea that ilan na lang yung ganyan natin. That was, di ba? That was ide debate pa natin. Yun nga eh, like imagine if Germany only had Heidegger, right? Imagine how difficult it would be because I mean, Germans and maybe they can easily question Heidegger and all of that because they have so many people to talk about, right? Or or, or Nietzsche, whatever. And and my sense is like Luna is such a giant in, in the Philippines, uh his uh you know art history in the late 19th century and his mm -hmm. achievements so singular among Filipinos that perhaps a lot of people are just saying, yeah, parang baka mag, pag ma cancel siya, wala na tayong ma no, di ba? We, we cannot hold on to anything like that. I know you are gonna disagree with it because one of the things I, I saw talk to Lele was Lele was saying but the thing with Luna is that he's crowding out a lot of other Filipino artists that would come, not only during his era, but for the next hundred years, including many Filipino Americans or uh, Filipinos based in the U.S., New York, at the cutting edge of arts. So there's the argument of crowding out effect. Now, it's not only strategic silence. We're just putting him so much on a pedestal that it's it's like blinding us to the genius of the other Filipinos who were actually much more even let's say, innovative in terms of their artistic style. I mean, where do you stand on this thing? I mean, for me, this, the whole thing is just so tragic and so difficult. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I see your point yeah. about the debate. I'm just trying to explain to you why some people just don't want to go down there, that road because like, ito, siya na nga yung ano natin, ano yung pa natin. Di ba? Alam mo ganun, yung ganun na minds. But, I, 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 but that, that's, that's not at all what I'm thinking about. What I'm thinking about is that uh, criticism, uh, constructive, Criticism, right? Informed right. criticism uh, does not result in "quote unquote" canceling uh, someone like Luna, uh, it, but in fact, uh, it uh, further deepens our appreciation of them, right? Uh, you, you, you know, it, it's like with Rizal. I mean, Rizal is such a, a genius that uh, no amount, no amount of critical uh, uh, sort of takes on Rizal, no amount of interpretation can possibly exhaust. His work. I mean, the Noli and the Feely are just, you know, incredible. They're just amazing, right? Hands down. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, all Philippine literature begins and ends with with Rizal, right? And so with Luna, uh, the idea that you would critique him, the idea that you would ask questions about his his life in relation to his work, the idea that you would bring in all these other sort of, you know, sort of uh, <clears throat> what you might call uh, sort of unfortunate. Uh, uh, sort of violent aspects uh, of his life, especially his relationship with Paz, uh, is not tantamount to taking him down. It's in fact all about uh, enriching 
uh, and furthering our appreciation of them, right? Uh, you know, you would start by asking again to go back to the earlier discussion we were having. All of this were, was a reflection about uh, masculine anxiety, right? Uh, uh, all of this had to do with sort of illustrado notions of what the proper conduct for a man is. Uh, around questions of, you know, what does a man do when he discovers that his wife is having uh, an affair, right? Uh, how should he how should he react? I mean, these are questions that we still ask today. You know, they're they're encoded in our laws. They are uh, woven into our culture. Uh, the question of you know male violence of masculine. Uh, toxicity, as you, as we were talking about yesterday, I mean that has its connections with Luna, uh, to be sure, and not just uh, not just one, but also his his other brother Antonio. No, uh, so so what we're really doing is we're expanding the scope of our argument beyond art to I, I, I get it, Vicente. Of, You're kind of saying like Rizal with the fur without the fur coat and all. Of that. I, I get it. I mean, which is what Ambeth has done. I think Nick Joaquin, a lot of our good friends have done a good job of you know showing complexity of Rizal and don't put him on the pedestal. The thing I say is, in this case, there was there was a crime, right? So there are people who actually wrote Vicente uh, uh, things uh, criticizing the whole you know publicity, uh, you know, it's a hype around the high no high minute because they're saying, hey. This guy is a wife killer. Why are we even talking about? You know, so like there were there were attempts to cancel him. So you know, unfortunately, it's very I, I I'm completely 100 percent with you. Now the problem is it tends to be the polar opposites, either super on the pedestal, Juan Luna, and this is the holy grail, or yeah, this guy is crazy. Let's not talk about him again. So cancel culture was coming in. Eh? We we saw and there were a number of articles we sent that tried to essentially cancel the guy and say he's not no, even no, yeah, because... yeah, yeah, but you know you know what I would say to that is there's a middle ground. And the middle ground is what are the sources? What's the information? What do we know? And so I would start with saying, why don't we the processo? The processo is is the is the uh, transcript of the trial, which is very interesting. I, mean, I one of my students oh, yeah, wrote about right. this. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the sources? So let's let's let's, for example, uh, somebody should do this. They should they should edit and translate the processos. There's a version in French and there's a version in Spanish, and they're they're quite and they and they differ in significant ways. And you know they should both be published. There is a ton, and I mean a ton, of journalist journalistic articles in French as well as in Spanish about Luna. Let's bring it out. Right. Let's put it out Extra and analysis. let people decide. Yeah. In other words, let's have the sources out there instead of just, you know, uh, drooling over one particular painting. Why don't we uh, do the historian thing? Why don't we do the scholarly thing and say, uh, so what did people write about? I mean, Luna was considered to be uh, sort of this heroic figure, actually. You know, I mean, that, that he won. He won in the in, in, in the uh, what do you call it in 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 the uh, uh, in public opinion, right? Because they all thought that, you know, he was this fantastic artist and he, he was driven by a crime of passion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so all of that should come out, you know? Uh, and and, and uh, if, I was, if I was a Luna scholar, I would do that. I would say, let's get it out. And it's very easy because, you know, it's easy to get the stuff from, from uh, the archives in France and in Spain. Right. Uh, if my student, if my graduate student is able to do it, anyone can do it. Right. So I why see, don't we do I that? I, I would start with that. Yeah. We said, we said, um, mm, what, what do we know so far? Uh, I, I mean, mm -hmm. as a non-specialist uh, on mm -hmm. this issue, what is your understanding mm -hmm. based on the Spanish and French texts? Because I know you're familiar with the languages, too. Yeah. yeah. What is your yeah. understanding so far? And what are also the. Uh, is it a uh, is it a when you say the difference between the French and the Spanish one? Is it a question of the Spanish observers were processing this differently, or there was a translation issue? Uh, yeah, that those, I, I think that yeah, I, I haven't looked at the differences that clearly, but there are some things in the French transcript of the trial that was omitted in the Spanish transcript of the trial. But you know, the the two are, are fairly close, and as I said, it would be very interesting to see what actually happened, what kinds of questions was asked were asked and so forth and so on, uh, how Luna himself was coached, because it is a whole account of how he was coached before the trial uh, and uh, how, how the part of the Taveras 
testified, you know, what the testimony consisted of. So, uh, you know, it's very interesting to take a look at those things and, and, then, and then people can come to a, their, own, their own judgment of, you know, uh, what happened. So, yeah. I see what you're saying. You're, what you're saying, there's just so much more to dig in. I mean, there's so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, uh, the, you probably know Martin Arnaldo, right? He's a, he's a, a scholar of Luna. He's also an advertising guy. And he was he did this nice little short film about the, the unveiling in Ayala. Yeah, he's been working on this forever. And he's got enormous yeah. amounts of archival material at the tips of his finger, uh, at the tips of his fingers. And I mean, it, it would be so great you know, if 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 people could interview him, if he could you're come right. up with his film, yeah, uh, you're right. you know, he's been doing this for years, man, uh, and and he knows every detail of uh, Luna's attempt to catch uh, a, a pass uh, flagrante delecto right? in the act, right? Uh, I mean, it, Luna would follow yeah, her. Na, no? yeah, oh, he was really, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. He, because he you know he was he was driven by jealousy, right? And so. Uh, you know, he would follow her when she would go out. And in the context like of col colonialism, right? And the whole, mm -hmm. you know, with the white man questioning how much of a man I am as a as a colored man. You know, right. I, right. I really, right. 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 Say, you said it like, I mean, of course, we live in an era whereby we're talking about toxic masculinity, regardless of color, right? Like, whether you're a mm -hmm. white man or color. Mm -hmm. But but my, that's my thing. Eh? Like, I think the sociological discussion and the, again, this is not an excuse for a lot mm -hmm. of nonsense out there. Absolutely not. You and I, we said, they were the most, I don't know, cosmopolitan. But my thing is, I think, some, I remember sharing this with some female friends, this issue of mm -hmm. this questioning yung pagkalalake ng isang mm -hmm. tao, especially us Asian men when we're in the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the Western context. And I, I remember the, the reaction from some of the female friends that I raised it is that, Oh, I never saw it from that angle. No, parang mm -hmm. it's always this kind of a not so variegated view of oh, basa mga lalaki gaya, gaya, gaya. And I always mm -hmm. said also like there has to be a proper analysis of this is. I'm I'm not sure if this is a safe territory to go in like, but the but proper analysis of also how the sense of you know many of our women you know marrying foreigners and how does that feel makes you know I mean I'm a product of that right <laughs> like you know. Um, I know this is kind of a tricky territory, right? But um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, we said yeah. that we let's be honest about it, and I, that's yeah. what I love yeah. about you is because you bring this to the to the surface in ways that no one else dares to talk about. But I always yeah. hear it behind the scenes. You get yeah. what I'm saying? Like so when you said there's a lot of this echoing into our era is because this idea of you know our you know marrying the foreigners and like what so because it's still there. The the, the sociological trends are still there. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think I think that uh, uh, I mean you'll have to ask women themselves, of course. But you know, I mean, this is this is an old, you know, uh, what's her name, the the the, the girlfriend of Jose Rizal, si Lino Rivera, right? Who does she end up marrying? She yeah. ends up marrying an English engineer because she realizes that it's not safe to be with Rizal. Right, that if she were to go with Rizal, I mean, she'd end up being in not just her, but her whole family would end up being in deep, deep trouble. Right, so so she goes for the foreigner, right? Uh, and it's then of course, option. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then of course, I wrote that book called The Promise of the Foreign. Right, so the foreign, the idea of the foreign holds a certain a certain kind of uh, uh, aura, holds a certain kind of promise, precisely a certain kind of promise. Uh, and I can imagine, uh, in the case of women, uh, and, and again, this is something that that is, is partly speculative, but I think it's something that that's held up by a lot of historical and sociological analysis. I mean, the Philippines has always been a patriarchal society, and if you're a woman, right, there are certain prices to pay, certain costs you bear by living in a patriarchal society, right? I mean, there's certain kinds of opportunities that aren't open to you. Uh, and certain kinds of barriers that you have to deal with. I mean, case in point, Laila de Lima, what the fuck is she doing in jail, right? I mean, that to me is a product of our patriarchal politics, that you have someone, Laila de Lima, who's still in jail. Uh, and so it's not surprising that certain women would want to marry a foreigner, would want to have at least the opportunity uh, to get out of this patriarchal bind. But of course, what happens uh, usually is a lot of them end up in another kind of patriarchal bind 
unfortunately yeah it's, 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 it's uh, levels no it's, it's just a question it's, it's, of levels yeah it's so. not it's not a guarantee no it's not a guarantee but you have to admit that you know uh, there's certain kinds of opportunities that open up if they live in the united if they move to U the uk or to the united states or to france or various other western countries opportunities that aren't available to them uh, in the philippines right so so it's not about filipino men it's about uh, a certain kind, a certain structure, certain kind of uh, gender politics yeah. that uh, the coordinates men. of possibility, right? The yeah, coordinates not, of possibility. No, no, yeah, but not only that, it compels men, uh, many of whom might do things against their will to act in a certain way, uh, and 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 women who find themselves precisely captive uh, to those certain ways. So you can have you can have men who have all the best intentions in the world, but the very uh, sort of uh, pressure, uh, the, the 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 cultural and, and social pressures of uh, again being a man in the Philippines, right, compels them to act in a certain way, uh, even if it's against their 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 will. Uh, that has a very disadvantage uh, effects on uh, that has the effect of disadvantaging women. And so I I would think that this would be one of the reasons, not the only reason, but certainly one among the one among the many reasons why they may want to marry a foreigner. Uh, and and leave the country. Yeah, thank you for really you know looking at the fifty shades of this very contentious <laughs> issues. I always I like I like yeah. the, the the fifty yeah. shades analysis literally and yeah. figuratively. Um, no, no, but 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 yeah. the point is, I, I'm not blaming the men, huh? I'm not blaming the men. I'm blaming it. I'm blaming the structure. I'm blaming yeah, the culture. It's a, it's a systemic that, critic. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that also has the effect of forcing them to live and behave in a certain way even against their will no? so yeah it it has that kind of scaffolding effect no um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You're right yeah. you're right yeah. um vicente uh, pwede natin pag-usapan yung libro mo yung promise of the farm because it, that's a luna painting right like the yeah um, yeah yeah the, uh, the cover that's yeah. my point the reason i said you're the right person though is because one of your most uh, influential books has no less than luna there pwede natin yeah. pag-usapan yan because ganito eh like Bilang isang Pilipino, one of the weirdest thing is that most of us cannot access the founding fathers' documents in their original uh, version. It's really weird. It's like it's like contemporary Americans speaking French and not being able to access, you know, what Jefferson was writing or Adams and all. And 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 there's always this weird feeling when we deal with our Spanish counterparts and friends. This kind of a, like lost and distant cousins who are still you know, grasping for something to to share with each other because there's this big era of America, which is temporarily, in terms of, you know, temporality, it's actually short, but in terms of geopolitical impact, psychological impact, it's just overbearing, right? Just the impact of America is so overbearing. But at the same time, it's hard to understand contemporary Philippines without understanding more than 300 years of Spanish mm -hmm. influence. And many yeah. people would argue the reason why the Philippines tend to be much more liberal compared to a lot of its neighbors is precise because of our exposure to liberalism while we were a colony of Spain. Not necessarily because of Spain per se, but while we were a colony of Spain, but we can talk about the Cadiz constitution among others. Can we talk about can, can we talk about how strong and 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 decisive do you think the influence of Spain has been, and especially this promise of the foreign and how that will mm -hmm. leads into our interaction, not only with the US. But now also with China, right? I mean, China mm -hmm. is now the new promise of the foreign. No, I mean, it's, it's incredible how things are turning mm -hmm. out, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the, I wrote that book as a follow up to uh, my earlier book, Contracting Colonialism on Christian Conversion, right? Yes, and, yes, I, I. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the idea of of Spanish influence. I mean, it starts there. It starts with Christianity. It starts with uh, the idea of being assimilated into this sort of universal Catholic uh, sort of world uh, that somehow would make uh, indigenous Filipinos uh, in some ways co-equal with Spaniards under the eyes of God, right? So there was always something in Christianity and in the process of conversion that promised uh, a certain kind of emancipation of liberal, if, what you might call a uh, a, a certain kind of freedom or freedom from sin, as it were, right? Uh, and then, and then nationalism, in some ways, replaces that promise, right? If in a word, what is nationalism? Nationalism is a replacement for religion, right? And it brings with it that same kind of promise 
of equality, of emancipation, uh, and so forth and so on. Of course, it, it, there's all kinds of complications. In, in, the, in, in the meantime, things go wrong, uh, and instead of emancipation, opposite uh, things are, are, are produced. Uh, so yeah, I, the, the, the Spanish colonial period is so important because of that, you know, prior to the introduction of American influences, or I should say this, one of the reasons why Filipinos became so receptive uh, to US colonialism was because many of the things that the United States brought with them had already been preceded and already been, been laid out uh, during the Spanish colonial period, especially uh, the later uh, period from, from the 1860s, 1850s, 1860s, all the way up to the turn of the century uh, when a certain kind of Spanish liberalism was introduced, right? And 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 uh, the the idea of uh, the, both both the promise and the danger of that liberalism was precisely what was at stake in in uh, in the revolution uh, of eighteen ninety six. Right. So, yeah. um, I, I I like this. Uh, so. Because, you know, in order to understand why the Philippines had the first revolution of its kind in Southeast Asia, but of course we have to also understand why it was the last among Spanish, former Spanish colonies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, obviously, there are two sides to this. No? So if you're, if you're Ileto you'll more, or, or Agoncillo for that matter, you'll more talk about the grassroots. No? So whether it's the passion from a cultural standpoint, whether it's the Bonifacio role. But at the same time, of course, the if you're the Nick Joaquins of this world, you'll more talk about our complex heroes and the decisive role they played. Now, how do you see the interplay between these two? Because now I think John Seidel's argument is these two cannot be understood if you don't also look at the global cosmopolitan aspect, right? Mm -hmm. The Spanish-American War, the exposure to Freemasonry. I want to talk about that, like how how important was the role of Freemasonry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. You, you have, we have extensive written yeah. on that also. Yeah. Yeah. But first yeah. of all, how do you adjudicate between these two? Because... Diba kung nationalist literature ka sa Pilipinas, ay yung mga Rizal, yeah. mga yan, mga kano lang yan, eh, mga overrated yeah, yeah. mga yan. Dito tayo kay Bonifacio, yeah. dito tayo sa pasyon, yeah. sa mga ginagawa talaga ng taong bayan. Yung mga, uh, or, or even, you know, uh, yeah, exactly, the, the you know, the uh, friasco, I mean, the 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 lay people who were subcontracted to evangelization, diba? They're the yeah. ones who start yeah. turning against the Catholic hierarchy and pushing yeah. for reform. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah, no, I think I think I think the the, the uh, disagreements are more apparent than real because if you think about the sort of you know what you've been calling grassroots, uh, you know, I, I mean, if you follow Ray Leto's argument, uh, many of them were driven by a certain understanding of folk Catholicism. Uh, the, the 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 point there is it's still Catholicism, and where does Catholicism come from? I mean, it comes from the Spaniards, right? Of course, it's been appropriated, it's been worked over. Uh, but even even the structure of these peasant movements, you know, they they had their popes, they had their uh, you know all kinds of uh, they they had the passion and so forth. And again, these are all these are all Spanish influences, right? Uh, try as you might, you can't argue your way outside or of that of that Spanish matrix. You know, it's still the the Catholic colonial matrix. The framework is still, still yeah yeah the framework yeah exactly exactly exactly. And then in the case of the Illustrados, I mean that's that's even more apparent, right? Uh, in the case of the Illustrados, it wasn't just a Spanish influence, it was many, many other things, you know, it was the influence of Germany, it was the influence of France. Prague, yeah. Uh, Prague. Exactly, right? And, and, and there is, I mean, I think this is, this goes to John Seidel's argument that, you know, there, there, there is a, there is this incredible world that the Illustrados are being exposed to, thanks to the technological changes, the opening of the Suez Canal, uh, the 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 end of the galleon trade, uh, and of course the, the the many many revolutions that are going on in Latin America, uh, and and uh, you know the, onwards, yeah. it, it, exactly, and and the stuff that's going on in Spain with you know the uh, Cadiz Constitution, as you mentioned. Uh, and so forth and so on. So the, there's the, there's this incredible and and not to mention developments in science uh, that the people like Rizal, people like Antonio Luna. I mean, Antonio Luna was a chemist. Uh, Rizal was a doctor. I mean, all these people uh, were very much influenced by you know scientific developments that were going on at that time. So so you have you have this huge world that is opening up uh, to illustrados and they they're absorbing this. They're taking it in. And they're trying to figure out what to do with it. And these all become elements of an emergent nationalism by the late 19th century, including masonry, as you mentioned, 
you mentioned masonry, which I think is very important uh, and which uh, tends to be sort of poo-pooed by other historians, right? Uh, because when you think of masonry, masonry provided illustrados with a site for governing themselves. This was their first experience of self-government was within Masonic lodges. Yeah, the demo well, democracy, the voting, majority voting. Yeah, exactly, exactly right, yeah. exactly right. So Masonic masonry was extremely important, which is why the friars hated it, right? I mean, the church hated it, right? So, so yeah. So there were all these different elements that came into uh, the development of a certain kind of nationalist consciousness, all of which meant that they could break away from the influence of the church because the church was the most hegemonic institution at that time, right? Uh, and begin to think of themselves as self-governing, self-legislating people. And that is the essence of republicanism. Republicanism is all about thinking of yourself as self-governing and self-legislating. So, Thank you, Vicente, for that. Now, let's go to your thesis on Anong klaseng tao itong mga founding fathers natin? Of course, Rizal would not make it. Uh, Bonifacio also would not make it. So we're essentially talking about the Aguinaldo and, 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 and yeah. or even Luna, no, for that matter. Isa sa mga arguments mo is that pag tinignan mo itong mga yan, I mean, they were patriotic, given in, or nationalistic, whatever you want to call it. Um, Pero a lot of them, yung kanilang predisposition, no, ay hindi progressivo. No? Ito ay mga traditional na tao na, uh, let's say, counterfactual had the americans not arrived or let's say had the americans just gave up on the project because of massive domestic opposition let's say you know um let's say the mark twains of this world were much more successful in mobilizing the anti-colonization mm -hmm. campaign no? or let's say there was another war let's say with france and u.s and so you can think about many uh scenarios whereby the americans would not push it to its logical conclusion no the colonization of the philippines I mean, of course, one of the things I was thinking about is when we not Luna, and then we did the guerrilla warfare via, you know, my my homeland, like Cordillera's region. We could have done to them what the Vietnamese did, no? Uh, at the you know shorter time in a shorter time. Now the question is, let's say nanalo sila and nawala yung aspeto ng mga Amerikano. Either they didn't come, or it was truncated, or it was defeated. Mm -hmm. What kind of quote unquote republic we should have expected? I mean, let's do the counterfactual yeah. because. One reason we do a lot of romanticization or we just don't appreciate what they brought to the table is because eh, wala naman eh. Wala naman nangyari. Mga kano rin naman nag-take over. So let's just forget about it. Or no, yeah, it yeah. would have been amazing. Oh, these gringos, horrible people. Que horror, this happened. No. You know, let's push it. Let's do the counterfactual, which yeah. most historians don't want to do. You understand? But you're the one I want to ask about this. Well, yeah. You know, I, uh, a few years ago, I think 2015, uh, I uh, I wrote an introduction to uh, this fantastic book by uh, uh, Mila Guerrero, Milagros Guerrero. Uh, she wrote this book called Luzon at War, right? And I wrote an introduction to that book called uh, How Revolutionary Was the Philippine Revolution? And much of it was based on her on her uh, uh, unpacking of uh, the First Republic, right? So she 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 took a really uh, you know she took a scalpel to the First Republic. And uh, to answer your question, it's very easy to see what would have happened if the Americans hadn't come and if the Filipinos uh, sort of continued uh, to govern the archipelago. Uh, if you look at the record of the First Republic, and the record of the First Republic is very mixed, it's extremely mixed. Now, on the one hand, uh, there were certain revolutionary elements in the First Republic, you know, uh, they, and again, it's very much as it's named. You know, implies it was Republican. It was Republican in spirit. The separation of the church and state it was an attempt. You know, because they put together a constitution, very much inspired by different, you know, Latin American, American, and so forth. French, for that matter, yeah, also the French, French. French constitution. But then you look at the matter of representation. Most of the representation, of course, hundred percent representation came from elites, right? Uh, illustrados from the nineteenth century, but also uh, sort of some of the super rich people at that time. Uh, and these were the same people who would eventually come to occupy uh, the offices of the, of the first uh, you know, the colonial legislature, the, the Philippine Assembly in 1907. But nonetheless, if you look at the record, I, it was very, very problematic. First of all, uh, in order to raise, because they were constantly short of funds, in order to raise money, they, they reimposed Spanish taxes, especially poll taxes. Uh, they they reimposed taxes on uh, exchange of commodities, 
I mean, in other words, their fiscal policy was onerous in the extreme, right? And people hated it, right? Uh, <clears throat> there were strikes that occurred in Manila and some other places, uh, partly because of the terrible situation, uh, financial situation. And Aguinaldo's response was to call in the troops and to crush the strikers, right? Uh, there were uh, peasants who uh, sought to occupy lands that were deserted by their landlords. And again, Aguinaldo's response was to treat them as insurgents and get rid of them, right? Uh, there were constant complaints that poured into uh, Mabini. Mabini, who at that time was, you know, Secretary of State, and people would write in and complain in anguish, you know, that the soldiers are coming in, they're stealing our stuff, they're raping our women, you have to do something. And Mabini was like so anguished, uh, he almost quit precisely because of these problems. He couldn't do anything because, because there was no discipline to the troops. And the troops were all volunteer, were all volunteer troops. And as you know, with volunteer armies, uh, they don't get regular salaries. And so the only way they can get compensation is through booty, right? Through theft, right? So and, and so this is what they would do. They would come into town, they would they would, you know, look for jewels, they would rape the women and so forth and so on. Walang disciplina. And so and 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 the thing is that the central government couldn't discipline the troops because the troops were primarily loyal to the local to the local leaders to the local commanders not not to not to malolos not certainly not yeah. to, to aguinaldo so, so you had these multiple hmm. problems i mean uh, the long and the short of it is that even without the americans i don't think the republic would have lasted I don't think it would have lasted very long. Would have been uh, would that would it have turned out something? I mean, I mean, I'm seeing the shades of Chiang Kai Shek Generalismo here, whether it's Aguinaldo or or Antonio Luna. I can see shades of warlordism that would take over China, like kind of a mini miniature version in the film. And you can see, right? I mean, I, I I'll just replace some of the names you put there. I put Chiang Kai Shek. I put you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I I put uh, some warlord name in China. That very much comes to my mind, no. But do you think that there would have been also a possibility of a kind of a Filipino Mao Zedong, not necessarily in communist sense, but no, some no, 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 because, ideology? No, 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 or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to remember that ideologically speaking, uh, Filipino illustrados and revolutionary leaders and republican re leaders were all were all you know bourgeois, right? They're, they're liberal bourgeois, right? Uh, their their first yes. allegiance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the Philippines. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so they were very much invested in maintaining their property, right, and maintaining their 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 leadership, right. I mean, Rasil Mujeres, right, we would quote all these people. Uh, I forget exactly. Was it uh, Calderon who said this uh, that uh, Ilustrados were the brains of the nation, right? There was this understanding uh, that uh, society was hierarchically organized. Uh, Ilustrados were the leaders. And without them, uh, the country would collapse, right? I mean, this is the same uh, yeah. excuse, the same argument that uh, elites would use later on when they ask, why did you collaborate with the Japanese? Well, we collaborated with the Japanese because without us, it would have been much worse, right? And so this was their argument uh, in the First Republic, that that uh, the leadership, elite leadership was necessary in order to hold the Republic together. But elite leadership was only possible if elite property and elite privileges could be sustained, right? And and the republic, the government was the means for doing that. So had the Americans not come, you would have had an oligarchy, right? An oligarchy which, in many ways, would have been ill-equipped to maintain their power because they didn't have a military, a competent military that could back them up, right? They didn't have the institutional armature to help them out. They wouldn't have any way to enforce the, the law and so forth. And so they would have been very weak. They would have been prey to the Germans who were waiting outside to colonize yes. them. The German forces were already hovering around like yeah, sharks. Exactly. Yeah, they would have been prey to the Dutch in the south, certainly. The English, who had already occupied Manila in 1762, uh, would have been, you know, they would have come in. Uh, the French, who were beginning to expand in Indochina. And I mean, the they Japanese. were surrounded. And the Japanese, and the Japanese. Exactly, exactly. That. Exactly. I mean, the Japanese, of course, so would colonize Taiwan uh, in 1920. Very nearby, yeah. Exactly. exactly. I, in, in, and there's no, there's no question that Muslim Mindanao would have split off. There was no way they could control Muslim Mindanao. So what you would have had would have been a Republic of Luzon, right? 
uh, best. a republic. Uh, at yeah, best. A, re yeah at best. A, a republic of Visayas. You know, maybe made up of Negros, Iloilo, uh, Cebu. Maybe Cebu. I don't know if Cebu was a bit part. Yeah. Right? Uh, but it, certainly, na, medyo malabo, no? yeah, certainly, yeah, yeah. So if if you know, and, and many people have said this that uh, one of one of the legacies of the United States was to come in and to forge the boundary that we now think of as the Philippines, right? Without the United States, the Philippines would have looked very, very different. You know, like that's 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 the. Like it or it's it's a difficult yeah. thing, right? To, uh, like I mean, as much as we're critical of the colonization process, but ironically, colonization helped the Philippines keep its yeah. together, right? I mean, it's it's yeah, just exactly. it's it's such yeah. a difficult thing. And and, I think, and, and, and yeah, and Richard, you, you have to remember that the, even this is very contingent because uh, the the United States uh, was was unsure. Uh, as to how much of the Philippines to keep. Exactly. You know, at first they thought, oh, let's just keep Manila. And then they thought, well, let's have Luzon. And then eventually Visayas. Uh, and then eventually Mindanao. But but they, they could have decided at, at any moment, forget yeah. Mindanao, so right? Resell it, no? resell it to the British and cut another treaty of Paris. No, exactly. I mean, exactly. Like, exactly. Grave. I, you could, if you look at it, there was nothing given about our current borders. I mean, we, we talk about as if, oh, it was ordained. It was teleologically supposed to be, but in there, like super contingent, super everything was arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. super. Um, I mean, we were really vulnerable to predation. This is the height of. Uh, this is the high noon of imperialism. We're talking about. Yeah, right? yeah. Late yeah that's that that that's why when 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 people talk about oh we're not unified as a nation, uh, my rebuttal to that is why should we be unified at all, right? I mean, who, there's who's nothing even about it. it. Exactly, because because the formation of the country is so arbitrary and it's so accidental, right? I mean, what we have today is a very accidental nation. You know, in fact, I, that, that's probably the title of my next book, The Accidental Nation. <laughs> no, I mean, obviously you can make that argument about many post-colonial states. You know, I can think about yeah, Pakistan, yeah. I can think about, you know. Oh, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, but, yeah, but you're yeah. right, you're right. I mean, at least in the case of Vietnam or even in case of Indonesia, there was a kind of a Majapahit Srivijaya precedence, right? If you look at right, the right, right, realm right. of influence, right? In right, right, Vietnam, right. of course, especially Northern Vietnam, you know, not Cham, but the Northern Vietnam. You can, but Satin, well, I like, I would always say, uh, you know, from a political science point of view, the Philippines was exceptional in the sense that we never had the kind of large scale polities that we saw in other Southeast Asian exactly. countries, you know? Uh, exactly. Forget about gunpowder nation state systems in the Middle East or South Asia, a region that I'm also very familiar yeah, with. But yeah, like yeah. even in the Mandala system sense of the word, right? I mean, some of my Malaysian friends, you know, the, the Mayabang ones will say, oh, Philippines, di ba Manila, ano lang kayo ng Brunei? And it was like, like, what kind of country is just a, it's just a puppet of Brunei, right? Because Manila was, you know, with a tributary of Brunei, right? People forget yeah, that, yeah. right? I mean, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, yeah, uh, this is yeah. not to uh, bring us down, but but the reason, uh, the, the first time I was really confronted by this inconvenient, quote-unquote, truth was yung essay ni Nino Aquino sa Foreign Affairs, right? Which is like, mm -hmm. uh, where he argued that, many would argue na, parang suerte pa ang Pilipinas na it didn't go its own way because we would have ended up kind of like, imagine a Sukarno but on steroids, right? Like, kind of the crazy mm -hmm. situation Indonesia will have from 1950s to uh, until the genocidal situation in the mid 1960s, but um, why wouldn't the Philippines go through the same process, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, because yeah. by the mid mid 20th century, there was also significant liberal influence, not to mention socialistic influence in Indonesia. So, you know, like there are many things we take for granted, you no, know, precisely yeah, because of the yeah. poverty of meta narratives about the teleological lang yan, but um, there's nationalism, it gets downloaded and then it gets operationalized, and we go here, right? Yeah, yeah. So many yeah. things could have gone off script along the way. Yeah. Contingent, yeah. I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so some final thoughts on this part before we transition to the modern Philippines, because I think mm -hmm. uh, the, because I, I'm going to the critical junctures here, and, and the next mm -hmm. one I want to talk about is Commonwealth and your argument that Manuel Quezon could have been our first supremo, right? A full mm -hmm. supremo. Had he had. No, it's, not, it's not my argument. That's Al McCoy. Exactly. So, so I mean, the I'm idea. Okay as long as I said that. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, the, so let's talk about that very shortly. But are there some final thoughts on this, the contingent and very fragile you know, of nature of our, our revolution and our national borders? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I teach my Philippine history course, 
I always tell my students, you know, that one of the things that characterized uh, pre-colonial Philippines was the absence of a kind of classical culture, right? We, we don't have the, the sort of, you know, the Hindu influence, the large scale Hindu influences of Buddhist or Islamic, except for further south, right? Uh, and I, I mean, in some sense, that makes the Philippines sort of exceptional vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of Southeast Asia. On the other hand, the absence of classical culture meant that uh, Filipino culture or native culture at that time, pre-colonial culture, was characterized by this uh, incredible creativity, this uh, energy for improvisation, uh, this ability to adapt uh, and to uh, sort of, you know, think in all sorts of hybrid ways, uh, which would serve it well. Uh, in the process of colonization. So uh, what, what some people might think of, like your Malaysian friends, what some people might think of as a disadvantage, I think of uh, as an advantage, you know? So that's that's the way I, you know, it's it's one reason why Filipino diaspora is able to uh, uh, sort of uh, move on and, and be able to adapt to different conditions and so forth and so on. Because, you know, the, the question of adaptation and, and, and hybridity, you know, that's, that's, in, in some ways, it's wedded into uh, Filipino, in, uh, sort of Filipino pre-colonial culture, and that is sort of what continues and allowed them to survive so many waves of colonialism. Thank you very much. On that note, Vincent, yeah. let's end this first episode version of our discussion yeah. <laughs> before we talked about quote unquote modern Philippines. Thank you very yeah, much. Sure, 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 sure.